Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I, I wish we were in person. I hate doing this over Zoom, but we will make the most of it. Um, you know, you, it's really a pretty awesome thing that you get to be involved in research and you get to actually work on actually delivering a product. I love that the University of Utah has uh, the uh, you know this office which has a symposium at the end that you can actually show off some of the work that you do. But I imagine that many of you probably feel like, where do you even begin when it comes to putting your slides together, your poster together? You maybe feel nervous, like what's the, the right or the wrong way to do this? Um, so I don't pretend to have all the answers by any means, but I have done this a few times and we've gotten a few things uh, that, that seem to be working. So I'd like to share some of the things we've learned with you. So uh, maybe just to start, I'll recognize that everything that I say is really just like my opinion, right? And if you've got a different opinion that's totally okay um you know the people i've learned from are some awesome folks like for example jean-luc dumont how often can you say that you went to a seminar and it changed your life in 2013 i went to a seminar like the one that you're at today and it changed my life it completely changed the way that i present science that i think about how i talk to other people um it gave me confidence when i used to get really nervous about these things so um so if you got nothing else if you're going to do nothing else from this entire meeting Will you do me a favor and write down tiny.cc forward slash Dumont, D-O-U-M-O-N-T. Maybe Shiver could put that in the chat. Um, it, that'll take you to a link. It's one of his YouTube talks that he gave at, I think, Stanford or Berkeley or something. It's fantastic. I'm going to do a worse job than he would, but I'm going to do my best sharing some of the tricks uh, that he's shown me over the years. And I'm also going to show you some tips from my own postdoc advisor, Dr. Ram Sashadri, um, puts together some beautiful figures. And so a lot of what I'm going to present today comes from them. All right, so let's get started. What makes a good figure? If you're going to make your poster, right? It's going to be filled with figures, right? There's good and bad figures. What's a good figure? Well, I think that a good figure is one that is filled with, you know, well-designed, interesting data, okay? Tufty, one of the people who writes in this area, he describes it slightly differently. He says an effective figure is going to take a complicated idea, and then they're going to portray it with clarity, precision, efficiency, okay? So take this figure on the right. This might just look like, holy cow, there's a lot going on here. Why, why do this? But... This came from a paper that I worked on when I was a postdoc ages ago. And in that paper, we had a basic premise that we were trying to prove to people, which had to do with these magnetic transitions that existed, right? So if you look on the X axis, it's all in temperature, right? And you have this dotted line and you have this dotted line and then this third dotted vertical line. And there was two of these temperatures corresponding to these first two dotted lines that were well known, like the field already understood those. But there was a third one that we were trying to convince them that maybe something else was happening at this third temperature that you know people didn't understand yet. And so by taking all these different types of measurements, and it doesn't matter what they are, they are different types of measurements, by stacking them up in this way and showing them in the way that we did, we can really try and get the point across that maybe something's happening there at 20 Kelvin, right? At least that's the idea behind it. It was a difficult idea, but this figure kind of brings home that, oh, there sure looks to be a lot of evidence that all kind of supports that maybe something's going on there. Okay, well, let's uh, compare as we talk about good plots. Let's contrast them and you know to what are what I think are bad plots, right? So here's one from a default plotting program that you have all used before. This is Excel, right? And the default plot that it makes is actually not great. Um, I've actually updated this recently because it used to be worse. They're better now, but it's still not great. Um, so first off, when you when you make this figure, what comes to my mind anyways is like, well, why is the default that every chart needs a title? right? That chart title is not doing very much for us. And if you're putting this in a paper, you're almost certainly going to have a figure caption, which means it's just wasted space, right? Why on earth did they put this legend off of the plot by default, right? That makes your figure, the space that you have available to work with, it essentially cuts it in like two thirds, okay? Um, I think it is hard to see these different measurement points. Um, they're certainly all like the same type. They're all circles. And so if you are colorblind, if these colors were hard to visualize, that might be difficult to see. Um, there's font size that is irregular sort of throughout this, this image. The X axis label formatting is not great. They automatically did this sort of scientific notation, but it's not clear why they needed that or if this was even the best way to do scientific notation. Um, the colors are okay. The, Excel's come a long ways. Their, their old colors 20 years ago when I was a student were not great. Uh, they're better, but I would call them unimaginative, right? The markers and the lines are both uniform, so you can't tell these things apart easily, especially if this was printed in grayscale, right? So what, what could we do a little bit differently? Oh, by the way, this is all in a five inch format. Um, when you do slides for presentations like today, five inches is not a bad place to start in terms of width. But when you actually put figures in a paper, 
Well, then how big are they? If they go in a poster versus a paper versus a presentation, they're going to be different slide sizes, right? So take a paper, an 8.5 by 11. You have 8.5 inches there. So if you start figuring out how much space you have available, of that 8.5 inches, you really only have 3.5 inches per column. And most journals are two-column format. So... You know, the image that I showed you before in five inches wide, that's even bigger than you're going to have in the paper. In the paper, you're probably only going to have three and a half inches wide, right? So when you shrink this thing down even further to three and a half inches, it starts getting small. It starts getting to the point where it's tricky to see some of this stuff, which again, on a slide today, I can make as big as I want, but in the paper, you won't have that luxury. So one of the things that I'm a really big fan of is to maximize the space that you have to work with by doing square or even taller than they are wide figures, right? Do things portrait style as opposed to landscape style. And it just gives you more space to work with instead of cramming into some small area, okay? So let's compare things with a, with a plot that I put together thoughtfully using Python. If you haven't ever programmed in Python before, don't worry, it's really not as hard as you think. I'm happy to provide links um, to all the tutorials I've put together on this. You don't have to use Python. You could make this with Qt Grace. You could make this with, heck, you could make something that looks almost like this in Excel. It just isn't gonna be the default plot that Excel is gonna give you. You're gonna have to work at it a little bit to get it to look like this. But what's different? Well, no chart title needed because most of the time you don't need those. The legend is within the plot area. Where possible, I think you should try and put that inside the plot and that doesn't always work. Sometimes you have to put it outside, but sometimes you can do it inside. Um, the ticks are uniform on both axes, so both axes have ticks. I like to put my ticks all the way around because it makes it easier. If you're really going to try and read like this red point here, I think more tick marks going all the way around is helpful as opposed to having them just on two axes. Um, the x-axis label formatting is now much better, right? This is the exact same data as you saw previously. It's just formatted more nicely. The colors, I would say, are beautiful. Um, the markers are now unique with each data set. You've got triangles, squares, and circles, and we could go on, right? There's lots of options to choose from there. Um, the font size is all uniform all the way throughout the figure. And what's great is that even if you shrink this down to three and a half inches, it's just easier to see the data. Like it's easier for me when I look at this to actually extract information from this plot. And let me just show you like, and I didn't monkey with this. This is exactly how Excel would give it to you versus how if you give it a little bit of effort, how you could compare these two figures side by side at the same width. And it's not even a comparison. I mean, one is way better than the other. So, you know, this is just some of the, the things that I like about a good figure. And you might have some ideas yourself and that's totally fine, but at least here's a few things to consider. Um, let's talk about colors for a moment. Uh, so a good palette of colors is going to make it as easy as possible for your audience to interpret the data. Okay, It's also going to draw attention to the appropriate parts of the data, right? So if there's one data series that's the important one, then use a color that stands out. If not, then don't do a color that stands out because it's going to distract, right? You're going to be thinking about whether the colors are accessible to all viewers and whether they're aesthetically pleasing and beautiful, right? What do I mean by aesthetic accessible to all viewers? Well, that's actually surprisingly common for color blindness, especially on, uh, among men. It's like one in, I can't remember, it's like eight or 9% or something. It is a very high fraction of men are colorblind. Um, so anyways, think about making something uh, colorblind friendly. What tools do you have available for you? Well, there's a couple really easy ones. If you're like, I don't know what makes like a beautiful color palette, or I don't know what is colorblind friendly, don't worry. Smart people have done this for us, right? Colorbrewer2.org is a great place to start. You can come to this website. You can tell them how many different data sets you have, right? This is a drop-down box that you can click, five, six, whatever. And then you can pick a color scheme, a bunch of really nicely put together color schemes. You can choose whether your data is sequential or diverging. So diverging would be something like uh, your average temperature versus the actual temperature. So across the country, the temperature is different, obviously, but everyone has like how far off from the average we are. Are we hotter than normal or cooler than normal? If that's the case, then you want to move into a diverging color palette where maybe it goes red in one direction and blue in the other, for example. Anyways, it has these options for sequential, diverging, or just qualitative palettes. Um, you can click this colorblind safe button and it will try and capture the most common forms of colorblindness and pr only provide colors that are going to help people out to see it. Um, it's rad. And then best of all, in my opinion, if you hop over here to this export button, you can click on it and it will actually produce a, a list, a Python list that you can just copy and paste right into your Python code, which is beautiful. It's fantastic. So uh, props to Color Brewer. I forgot her name. Cynthia Brewer at uh, Penn State. Well done, Cynthia, because this is a really great tool. Um, and there's other ones though, right? So this comes from the Seaborn color palette in, in library. So if you've ever worked with libraries in Python, it's just 
clumps of code that's like pre-assembled that does certain things like for example has certain colors that just look beautiful if you want a color palette in this rocket series which is the one that i'm using in my slides today you can pick as many different gradients in the rocket series as you want and then bam they're ready to go if you've got you know other things in mind they've got a lot of options that you can sort of pick from that change with luminance with saturation with all sorts of things um and then what i suggest is once you've picked a color palette stick with it all the way through your presentation or your publication. You'll start to notice it. Groups that do this, their papers sort of have like a, a signature style that you'll start to notice. Here's one from my student, Danny. She was wonderful. She did all these custom schematics for the paper. We were making these big, I'm a material scientist, so we make things and test them. She made these big old discs of these, what are called high entropy alloys, these fancy metals that we were making. And uh, she needed to test it in different positions along that disc. And so to make that as clear as possible, she drew her own really nice graphics that show, you know, these different discs at different heights. And then even within the disc, there's different sort of spots that we were assessing. And then later on in the paper, when we were measuring, you know, a different technique, something called X-ray diffraction, she uses the same color palette and had it even tied all the way throughout. So this formula, that gets that color all the way through every time that she talked about it, which was just great, okay? Um, so let's uh so that's my thoughts on colors let's talk about insets for a moment and i have to show you this one because this came from my very first research paper when dr sparks was like a young graduate student himself like this was me making my first paper and i felt great about this at the time my my boss at the time insisted that i use something called kaleidograph look at this poor landscape style thing right what's terrible about this is because i made two different figures and to put one as an inset, I just shrunk that puppy down and just like put it in there. And I thought that was great. And it's not great, especially when you shrink it down. If I look at the original PDF of this paper, you can barely read that stuff. It's tiny on there. So uh, I don't think that's the best way to show insets anymore. I think there's better ways to do it, um, namely using multi-panel plots. What do I mean by that? Well, before I show you multi-panel plots, let me show you another example where it's not an inset, but a multi-panel plot would have really helped. Take these two data sets. You've got the orange and the blue data sets. Okay? Now, if you look at them, it looks like the orange data set is just flat and that the blue one has a trend with the x-axis, that it's a dependent variable and the other one is independent, essentially. Um, and, you know, it gets worse when you make it smaller, obviously. But imagine what happens if you just replot that data and you separate out the data sets with their own axes, you realize that they both have essentially monotonic change with the x-axis, one positive and one negative. It's just that they change by different amounts. And by plotting those together, we were losing that information, right? So putting them separately, making it so the font size is uniform all the way throughout is really the way to go. Now, how did I do this? I did this by using what's called a multi-panel plot. The figure is still overall a square. It's, it would still be called figure one in my paper. Um, but it has two parts now, an upper panel and a lower panel. So by doing it this way, you can choose what axes you want them to have. For example, in this case, they have a common x-axis. So I didn't produce a, an x-axis label for the upper panel. But I do have two separate y-axis labels because I'm going to plot these on different scales, which allows you to more easily eat, you know, see and interpret this data with, the, with its error bars. Um, so that's my thoughts on multi-panels. You know, here I'm showing you a two-panel by one. But you could make this as complicated as you want. You saw when I started my talk off, I showed you like a five by one panel, right? And if that's the right thing to convey your message, if your message involves five panels of data, then I think you should know how to do that. And you shouldn't just do it in Excel where you sort of like eyeball it and like stretch it to be about the same size because it's not going to line up right. When you try and put that in a Word document, it's going to do crazy stuff. Just take the time to learn how to do a multi-panel plot. And unfortunately, I've said before, you can't do this in Excel. And then somebody sent me their prized baby that they did it in Excel, but like, why? Why would you go through that amount of effort to do it in Excel when it makes like a, just a dog of a plot? So my suggestion is that you take the time to learn one of these other plotting softwares. Um, the expensive ones are things like Origin or Kaleidograph. Um, maybe your research group really likes those and if so, awesome, use them. I think that college is the time to learn skills and some of those skills ought to be you're learning how to code in Python. It's free, it's easy. Um, I'll drop some links in the chat, maybe at the end of this thing, for some of my tutorials for making these things, but it's really not that bad. And it's, it, they make beautiful, everything you see in my plots here, my, my presentation here, we're all made in Python. Okay, now some of you will use photographs in your research. Maybe it's an actual photograph taken with the camera, or maybe it's a micrograph taken out of a microscope or something. Regardless, let's talk about what editing needs to take place on these. First off, 
most times if you're using a microscope image, it has all this other information that's sort of superfluous to what you're actually trying to present. You can see it at the bottom of this figure here. It shows you the accelerating voltage, the spot size, the magnification, the working distance, all that jazz. You don't need any of that. You need that when you're collecting the data, but your, your reader doesn't need to know any of that probably. In fact, the only thing that they do want to know is the scale of what they're looking at. How big is it, that what they're looking at? And that's the hardest thing to read here because that line is so small, especially if it gets shrunk, right? So what you ought to do is crop this. I like square figures. I think that they shrink gracefully as I've been showing you in today's presentation. So I make this thing square and I chop out all the nonsense and then I draw my own scale bar. You have to be careful when you draw your own scale bar. You have to make sure that you're being faithful to the actual data. You can't introduce error by getting it wrong. But yeah, draw your own and make it really easy to read. Put a shadow on it, put a black background on it. What do you got to do to make sure that it's easy to read that text? And all of a sudden, the main thing when they look at this figure, they can understand, you know, the particle size looks like it's about, you know, a micron or so. All right. There are lots of instruments that can produce plots for us uh, for better and worse, right? Some of them are just inexcusable like this one, and some are actually not that bad. What's so bad about this plot? Well, if we were there in person, I'd have you guys tell me. Anybody feel brave enough to do it over Zoom? Anybody want to chime in? What's What do you think is wonderful or terrible about this plot? There's not that many labels. Yeah. yeah, what's happening with that label off on the side? First off, that's absorbance, and they're saying that the units of absorbance are wave, well, that it's wave number, and the units are centimeters minus one. That's supposed to be centimeters to the negative one exponent, so that's just lazy. What happened there? What else is bad about this? It's hard to decipher the increments that are given because the values are so large. Yep. On the x-axis. You're completely right. And I think that that is, in my opinion, the worst, most inexcusable thing about this plot. You know, the fact that there's no y-axis, this type of data is what we call arbitrary units. You don't need to know the intensity of the y-axis. You just need to know where the peaks are at in the x-axis. They've plotted it backwards. That's just how the field does it. So we can't change that. The field of spectroscopy plots these units backwards for whatever reason, right? Um, but what's inexcusable is the fact that you can't tell where these peaks are at. Like this peak right here. How would you say what peak that thing's at by looking at this graph? You'd have to sort of like eyeball it. You're like, well, it's over 1,000 and it's under 1,500, maybe 14, right? Your only job with this plot was to help people know where those peaks were at, and they failed at that one job, which is pretty inexcusable. Yeah? Well, maybe how about this question? Let's say that the instrument just spits out this data. That's your only option. What do you do? Do you just use bad data because it's what you got? Or maybe this is like a paper in the literature and you're trying to compare your research to somebody else's research and you don't have their data. You just have the figure from their PDF for crying out loud. What do you do about that? Well, something that you can do is you can digitize that data from the image. Okay. So there's lots of tools for this. There's like Data Thief and there's, you know, there's others. The one that I like to use is called Web Plot Digitizer. You can just Google it, Web Plot Digitizer. What's great about Web Plot Digitizer is that it works in your browser. There's no download and it has an automatic data collection mode. Like for example, here, you see that there are, there's a green line, a yellow line, a red line, and this blue line underneath all these red points. So this is just an example image that they have. You could paste your image in here. You can literally just copy and paste it into the browser or you can load it from a little drop down box, doesn't matter. But you can then tell it to search for certain colors like here over here under this on the right hand side, they had this foreground color blocks. You can select that and you can choose different colors that are present in the image. In this case, they chose blue. And then you say, I'm gonna, I want this to automatically extract data by looking every 10 pixels in the X and the Y directions and asking if those pixels look like this color, right, that you've selected. And then it will automatically grab that data. And it gives you a chance when you first go to this website to align your axes to say that this pixel position is zero, this one is six in the x-axis, this one is negative two, that one is positive two. So you can align your axes. I can't tell you how valuable this tool has been. I use this at least weekly in my research, like all the time I'm doing this so that I can compare my research with other people's research in a, in a useful way. Um, very, very powerful tool in Webplot Digitizer. If you'd like to learn more how to use it and want to watch an actual tutorial, again, I'll, I'll drop a link to that uh, from my YouTube series. It's really easy to do. Here's an example of what it would look like, right? So the figure on the right was this crummy thing that I was trying to use for a homework question or a test question one year for my class. 
So instead of just using it in this grainy sort of ugly way how it was presented, just grab the data and paste it yourself, like plot it yourself in, in Python, and all of a sudden you've got really high quality data. Now you do need to make sure that in your figure caption you say data captured or redrawn from such and such a figure so that they know that this isn't actual data that you collected in the laboratory, but rather that it's data that you grabbed from somebody else. And, you know, Webplot Digitizer is not the only software that I think you should learn how to use. You know, matter, you know, we have researchers that, goodness knows, you guys do all sorts of crazy things. You model health and you do art and you do history and all these things. If there's a bit of software that your field uses, take the time to learn it, right? You'd be surprised. There's a YouTube tutorial for everything under the sun out there. If you need to learn how to draw crystal structures or if you need to learn how to do SolidWorks, there are tutorials that you can do. Like I was not a SolidWorks person and I drew up my shed in, you can see me right now. Look, I'm in the same shed. There we are. I drew it up in a weekend of work. Like that was a weekend well spent with learning how to do SolidWorks. Um, so I would say, take the time to learn how to use these tools um, because that, that's why we go to college is to learn skills. And it will only make you more valuable when you get out into industry at the end of college, right? And your research advisor is going to love it if you do this. Okay. Okay, let's just look at some nice examples of what I think are good examples of good figures. I already showed you this one, so let's skip past it. Um, how about this one? So on this paper that we were trying to write, the whole point of this paper was to say that if you collect data about how commodities are basically mined or produced around the world, in this case, we're looking at cobalt production. So the y-axis is showing you the market fraction of cobalt production from zero to 100% for all these different countries. If you have this data over time and then something geopolitical happens at a certain point in time, maybe you can actually see how that geopolitical event influenced things like commodity productions. That makes sense. There's, for example, a civil war and I messed this up. I need to go back and fix this. This text is black. I should move this down so it's not black on purple because that's hard to see or I should have done white text. And in, in any case, you can see with this dotted line that there is this Congo civil war essentially that happened. And the first civil war happened off the plot where we didn't have data, but the second one ended here. And what you see is that the Democratic Republic of Congo, which produces a large amount of our cobalt, even nowadays, it's, it's around 60% what it produces. Well, its neighbor Zambia had taken over production, right? And it wasn't until the end of the war that they slowly took back their minds that Zambia had basically taken over. So it's a really cool way to show uh, why, why is I think this is a good way? Because you took this cubulic color palette and the, really the only two data points that we care about are DRC and Zambia. But you don't want to just ignore these other countries, but by putting them in such a way that this one's at the top and this one's at the bottom, you see their change more dramatically than the small changes that happen among other countries. And you can see, oh yeah, there is an event that happened here. I just messed up my color. I should have done white on that line. How about this one? Here's a four panel plot. I have four different panels and they don't have to be just perfectly squares each, right? Um, in this case, we were looking at what happens when you squeeze a material. So pressure is plotted on the x-axis. That's a squeezing on a material. And then on the y-axis, we have Q. Q has to do with diffraction. That's something that a tool basically spits out and tells us some sort of measurement. And that technically is done at a bunch of different Q values and at every single pressure. And so if you do this at like 500 pressures, now that's 300 dimensions of data because there's the intensity of what you measure, the Q value, and the pressure. So three-dimensional data, how do you show three dimensions of data in a two-dimensional way? Well, one way to do it is with a heat map. So these heat maps show you where the intensity of the peaks are, and they show you how they change with pressure in a really useful way. But ultimately what we needed for this figure was to say, using this data from these heat maps, you can extract the volume of the, the unit cell, basically how squeezed together the atoms are. And then we can plot how that changes as a function of pressure. So it's a, it's a very dense way of showing a lot of information. Like I'm here showing you in five inches, what took my student like a year and a half of his life to generate and analyze, like bam, five inches, like main message delivered, okay? If necessary, it is possible to plot data very dense by having additional y axes. I don't think this is the right thing to do, but if you look in the battery literature, this is what they do. People in the battery literature do this. So you could either choose to challenge orthodoxy and don't make plots that are bad, or you can try and make these bad plots as best as possible by trying to make it as clear as possible. So here they have like way too much data. This was again from one of our papers. This is eight different data sets crammed onto one plot with different units. You see the dark blue things are the capacity of the, of the battery. The red ones are its coulombic efficiency. The light blue is the discharge energy density. So technically, yeah, it is possible to do these. I just am hesitant to think that this is ever the right choice, but realize that it is possible to do multi-panel 
or multi-axis or both plots. Um, how about this one? So a lot of what our group is, is machine learning. So we do these machine learning plots where you have your actual value and then you have your predicted value. And so you, you know, if your model was perfect and it got it totally right, all of your data would be along this 45 degree line. So we add the 45 degree line and then we show where the actual data points are and we put a fit through that. So you can see that like, yeah, the model's not perfect and it skews towards, let's see, uh, over predicting. It slightly over predicts compared to the actual values. Um, and then we've included these histograms on the side and the, and the top, which show you how dense these data points are. Because in this case, we were actually predicting some, you know, 100,000 data points or something. And those data points would all just stack on top of each other. So a way to show them and to show the, the viewer how dense the data is, is to either encode them with color, which we've kind of done. We made the points semi-transparent. So when there's a bunch on each other, it's darker. Or even better, just put the histograms on the side. Show the, the viewer how, where these points are at. Yep. How about this one? This is one from microscopy where we've got sort of zoomed out and then zoomed in, increasingly zooming in because I, the most common way that people would show this type of data is they would just do three different figures. But ultimately, you only have one message to say here. Your message is that this material is made up of two different phases and there's a different, there's a length scale over which these things sort of naturally segregate. In panel A, which is 100 nanometers length scale, you can see where they're at. Panel B zooms in where you can sort of see these individual two phases, HH and FH, and you would have to explain what those are in the caption right next to the figure. And then you've got the selected area diffraction that proves that FH is actually FH, like the phase that you think it is. So really nice job. This is a, a gal at UCSB that put this figure together. Um, here's another one. When you're dealing with real data versus models, when you're dealing with real data, every time possible, I think you should actually show it with data points. But if you're dealing with a model, like a theoretical framework for a model or something, you can use just lines. Here, what we were trying to show is that there's three different theoretical models. So that's why there's no data points here. These are all models. But I've shown them with three different types of lines. And then specifically, what I was trying to convince people in, in the one labeled this work, the solid line, is that this model is the only one that works over the entire Y range of values because the other ones enter into this sort of gray shaded region, which would only be possible if your material started to be really defective, right? And so we didn't think that, that was a likely scenario. And so this is a nice plot that can essentially say like, yeah, the other two models would require something to happen that probably isn't happening, whereas our model doesn't. Um, here's another example of a heat map where they actually then took slices at different temperatures and showed the two-dimensional data. So you took a 2D representation of three-dimensional data but then you also take slices at two dimensional data and show that next to it. And that might be a useful tool. Um, here's another one from, uh, this is called X-ray diffraction. So you have your intent, your intensity with arbitrary units on the Y axis. We're telling the viewer that they're arbitrary units. So they don't have to care about what they are, the numbers. What really matters is your X axis and these positions. And when you have multiple phases present, all these different peaks could be coming from different phases. So what we did to make it easier to interpret is we change the color of some of these phases. Like the orange one is the fit. The light blue one came from our sample holder, which we don't care about, but the orange ones could either correspond to this phase, the cobalt oxide, or the phase up top, the cobalt 304 oxide. And by putting these tick marks, what's called a histogram, where you, you say where these positions are at, it makes it easy to tell like this, this yellow line over here, which is part of the sample. Well, it looks like it's from cobalt 304 because there's no tick mark here from cobalt O. So I've seen a lot of bad ways to represent diffraction data and I've sort of settled on this is the best way to represent uh, this type of data from diffraction data. Okay, uh, let me let my dog out because she's whining. Give me one second. Okay, we've talked uh, a lot about figures and I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have about figures, but let's shift gears and talk about once you've made your figures and you like them, let's put them into a poster. Now, when it comes to making posters, this is why most of you are here, what's there to know? Well, there's a gazillion tips that you can find. If you look up like poster design tips, you know, you'll find loads and loads of them. I used to actually hand out some paperwork that had like 30 or something tips and they're fine. But I think that more important is to explain the reasons why they're fine. Because if you understand the reasons, then the individual reason doesn't make sense because if you focus on the big picture reason, you'll be making the right choices anyways. And there's really, in my view, three main things to think about as you design your poster. And they are as follows. First off, you are the product. The poster is just a prop. 
And I don't think people realize that. I think a lot of people think, oh, I did all this research. And when I go to these symposiums or this conference or wherever I'm going to present it at, people really want to know about the research I did. But they don't. They don't actually. They're there to see you and to talk to you. And they're going to talk to you about the research. But you are really the product. You are. You have to think, like, what's your goal from this meeting when you talk to them? It's probably, well, maybe you want to get into graduate school or maybe you want to collaborate with somebody and you need their resources. Maybe you want them to give, put in a good word for you at some other event that you're going to give at, or they, you want to be able to give an oral presentation next year instead of a poster, right? You are the product. The poster is just there to help you. So with that in mind, if the poster is just a prop, then you shouldn't put anything on that poster that doesn't help you sell you, is really my view on this. The biggest problem I see with posters is they're just full of text, right? If the poster is a prop, and nobody reads posters, which is my contention, then they shouldn't have much text on them. They should have very minimal text on them. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. The second thing that I think you should have in mind as you design your posters is that the audience has little time and little or no interest in what you did, at least at first. So it's your job in very short order to convince them to spend a little bit of time with you and to get them interested in your research and in you as quickly as possible. Right. And along those same lines comes point number three. You need to find a way to engage with every single poster visitor. Maybe some of you have been to a poster session before a symposium. If you have, then you know that I'm not joking when I say that they're usually in like a giant, you know, gymnasium or lecture hall, a, a, some very large, echoey, loud room filled with a couple hundred or a couple thousand people, especially some of these big conferences in like the field that I go to. My gosh, it's like 10,000 people and then they pack all of them into a session. A, a single poster session it's so loud you can't even hear yourself think and then you're supposed to talk to people these posters are typically like five feet apart the rows of posters so they're so narrow you can't even like walk through that area very easily because people are like just crammed in there you can't hear yourself think it is like the worst if you tried to design like a worse way to communicate scientific findings you'd be hard pressed to pick like a worse format than that like it's it's awful but that's what we've got so how do we work within those constraints to make sure that people get something out of their visit with us? We just have to try really hard and follow these rules will help. Let me show you a couple examples of posters. Here's just a whole bunch over the years that I've either made with my group or I was the judge of at a conference. And so I grabbed it because I liked it. So this one I was a judge for. Um, this one actually won first place. This, that all the judges liked it. Um, what's great about this poster? There's a lot of things to say that's great about this. First off, notice how much text is actually here. There's not that much text on this poster, right? They've got a great big text saying who they are up, up top, their, the, the title. They've got, you know, they're, they're from USC. Here's the research group. It's really nice to put a face to a name because if you're not standing next to your poster, again, the poster is supposed to be a prop that sells you. So show people who you are. Like a, a photograph is really great, especially if they're nicely done like these ones here. Um, here they show with some beautiful crystal structures what's happening inside of a battery. And they made it really simple. Intercalation happens. And while that happens, you're inserting or deinserting these lithium atoms. That's ha that's changing the crystal structure slightly. In this next panel, they show you that you can make these things with a really simple mechanism, right? They, they've got the steps really simple here. They're not adding any additional text that you don't need. Down here, they're actually showing the crystal structure, how they characterized it. Here's some measurements. It has, you know, whatever they're going to say about it. Here's three simple takeaway. The octahedral sites from four distinct rods along the four C3 axes of the cubic unit cell. These rods are tied together by the tetrahedral site. They form a network of close pack rods. If you're a material scientist, you'd be like, oh yeah, I get it. I love all this stuff. If you're not, you can still kind of understand what's going on because it's not so much text. It's simple, right? They've got a few things here on future work, a few things on acknowledgement, but you, you know, <clears throat> you should put front and center what matters on a poster. If your acknowledgements aren't the most important thing about your work, don't make them gigantic, right? Put in the center of your poster, the stuff that is important here. Okay, let's look at another one. This is one from the same group, a different project from the same group at this conference that I was at. Um, this one also, I can't remember what place it won, but it did well. Um, and some of the same hallmarks that you saw before are present here. One difference, you know, they say here motivation. I think that's such a waste, right? Future work, motivation. That's not saying anything, right? You can tell people what's motivating your work with a full sentence, right? Here they say, Interwoven rock salt and perovskite layers provide anion intercalation channels, making rosin popper oxides promising fluoride intercalation hosts. Now you have to be careful. In this meeting, they knew that it was 
all people that were, um, you know, experts in chemistry. And so that, that lets you use certain type of language that you can't use if it's a general audience. When you guys present at the, uh, you know, the symposium for the OUR, right? It's very broad, which means you can't use any language that your average person wouldn't know. That's really hard to do because by the time that you're at the end of your semester and you've been doing this for a while, you're getting pretty good at it. When they talk about things in your research group, you know, you can understand it and you use the jargon, but the people you talk to at these symposium halls will not do that. They will have no idea. And so you have to explain it as simply as possible. In fact, let's do an exercise. I want you all to take a moment and think about how to present your research in a way that gets, because remember point number two is that people don't have time or interest. So we're going to try and overcome that with three sentences. You're all going to describe your research in three sentences. The first sentence is, and it must be, why they should care about it, right? So think to yourself, what is it that you do? You're thinking in your head, what do I do? Now, you, when people ask you, you know, your grandma, you go visit her for on Sunday dinner and she's like, oh, you're doing research. That's great. What are you doing research on? Your temptation is to just say what you do. Like, oh, we make interwoven rock salt prowse cut layers that produce intercalation channel. Like, and they, they don't know what you're talking about. They don't care either. So you have to do the old politician trick. When they ask you a question, what do you do? Which is a very common, what's this poster about? What do you do? What did you, what did you work on? You don't tell them that. You instead, you answer a different question because the question that they really wanted to know the answer to is why should I care about this, right? So the very first thing that you should say to them in one sentence is why they should care about it, right? This works is clearly about batteries. So instead of diving in and getting into the chemistry of like why this crystal structure is better than that one and how you made it or measured it, you're not going to say any of that. Instead, you're going to say something that everybody, even your grandma or your, your little brother <clears throat> would care about when it comes to batteries, right? So let's, let's try that. Let me, I'm going to pick on Beth because she works in my research group. Beth, I know I saw you on this call unless you've dropped off. Let me have you give me one sentence why people should care about the research you're doing. Let's have you do it for the bead project that you're working on the, uh, the surgery tool. Yeah, sure. Um, as you said, it's important to adapt to your audience. So in, in one sentence, I would say, it's incredibly important for um, patients that are in, that are getting plastic surgery to have um, nice clean incisions. Therefore, um, electrosurgery proves a, um, viable option for surgeons to make clean cuts by um, first cauterizing the skin and then making the cut. Something That's like it. That. Great <laughs> job, Beth. It was maybe more than one sentence, but it was good. So the, the challenge with this one is like not everyone has plastic surgery, so it can be tricky to make sure that your project, whatever your research was, really is important to everybody. If somebody's planning on getting plastic surgery, then they're like paying attention. But otherwise, like how do you make this as broadly accessible as possible? You might start out and say something like, we, uh, people get plastic surgery for all sorts of reasons. People are born with deformities and you know, rather than living with that their whole life, isn't it amazing that we can fix those? Uh, and they're gonna nod, you, know, you notice that I asked you a question in doing that. I'm like, isn't it amazing? Like, wouldn't it be great that we can correct that? So they're definitely gonna say like, yeah, that is really great. I haven't said anything about the technology yet. I've just gotten them interested. Right. So sentence number one is get them interested. Sentence number two is you're going to tell them something about the hypothesis of your research. Essentially, you're going to say, why did you do the research? What why did you find it interesting enough or what was unanswered before you started your research that is leading us to do whatever it is that you did? That's sentence number two. So, Beth, give me a second sentence. Why are you doing what you're doing? I have particular interest in this um topic sorry i'm trying to think on the spot um, that's okay i have particular interest in this field because um you know there's many patients who don't um have particular don't have the best um incision sites after surgery and so um electrosurgery proves to make a clean cut by adding a um, electric signal to the skin and then it you know cuts a little bit cleaner oh I mean, you did so great very, <laughs> well done beth it's hard to do this on the spot so she's being a good sport for let me pick on her but you should all be practicing this 
you don't have to do it on the spot. When you are getting ready for a conference, you can practice this as many times as you want and you should. You should feel really good about those first three sentences prior to your symposium or conference or whatever, right? So Beth, let me help you out on this one a little bit. The unanswered research question is they've built a new tool and it kind of puts two tools in one. So I would have first said something about, man, boy, plastic surgery can really help some people in, in major ways. And then I would say, some plastic surgeons point out how hard it is to use these electrosurgical tools because they cauterize the wound as they cut, but to do so, it has to have this electrical sort of signal that touches the skin. And it's hard to basically like pull it open and cut it at the same time. So they typically have to like pull the skin up to have tension and then they cut it. And it's like a two person job because you have to have like two sets of hands doing this. We have proposed, and I'm doing more than a sentence here, so I would need to practice this myself, but we could say, what if there was one tool that could sort of spread the skin and cauterize, cut it at the same time? We think that we have a tool that does that, right? That's essentially it. Maybe I could make that whole sentence simpler. I could just say, hey, electrosurgery is really important. That helps people with, you know, deformities or whatever. That's sentence number one. Sentence number two is, most of the time, doctors have to use two hands, one to pull the skin apart and the second one to cut. We think it's possible to do that with a single tool but no one knows if this tool is safe for human use yet. So that brings you to your third sentence. Your third sentence should be one sentence. You get one sentence here of what you actually did. So way back to what they asked you, you know, what's your research on? Now is when you get to tell them. You get to tell them that, but you cannot use any jargon. You cannot use any jargon. You have to explain it like to your, your kid brother. So Beth, let's have you try sentence number three now. We've already told them that this device, it seems to be combining two tools into one and we want to make sure it's safe. What did you actually do? So what we did was we created a device to be used in the operating room that has three prongs on the end that look like this. Um, and they have little metal pieces in the crevice of the prong and um, it heats the ceramic part it heats the, the prong and then cuts it at the same time. So you can achieve the goal that that you're searching for. Yeah. Or your research in particular, Beth, you might even just say like, so we made this device and what my task is, is I test it. I'm testing to see if, if you use it, does it break up and dissolve into the person's body? Cause that wouldn't be good. Is it keeping its strength? Like they think it ought to, uh, I get to actually characterize that material to make sure that it is safe for human use. Right. So you could all track practice this. Anybody feel brave? Anybody want to do theirs? 33 people all just abject terror right now. If you were there in person, I'd just walk up to you. It'd be a lot easier. I'm just going to call someone from a list here. I'm going to pull up my scan of people's names. All right, Brittany Chen, are you on the call? Hello. Wait, sorry. I didn't <laughs> actually hear. Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to have you explain your research okay. and you're going to do it in three sentences. Sentence number one is, you're not going to say what you do. You're instead you're going to say why I should care about it. Okay? okay. Sentence number one. Why do I care about what you did? Sentence number two. Why did you care enough to do what you did to do what you did? Right? What was the unanswered question that you set out to answer? Sentence number three is one sentence of what you did with no jargon. Okay. Go ahead, Brittany. Okay. So around 700,000 people in the United States currently have what we call end stage kidney disease and you require kidney replacement treatment to survive. The most common thing to do in the US is have hemodialysis. However, the issue with hemodialysis is you need good access to blood because the whole point is that you just take out your blood, clean it, and put it back into you. This is going to unfortunately go over three sentences. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest issue with that is that every way that we get blood out leads to some sort of, there's always some sort of damage that comes with it. So you can't use it long term. So what our lab does and what I specifically have done is analyze data using computer simulations to see if we can apply some sort of clinical treatment to help increase the ability for people to use hemodialysis long term. Killer. Great, great job, Brittany. Really well done. Um, and that was your first try. You can practice this and refine it as much as you want, but that was really good. I think what people sometimes think is like with the poster, with this first touch, they have to get like everything out. They have to like, who knows how long this person can be in front of you. So you got to like really get up all the information of what you did, but that's not it. 
your entire goal out of these first three sentences is to get them interested enough that they ask a follow-up question. You want to start a conversation. This isn't a, a an oral presentation where you're just spouting about your research. You want it to be a conversation. So your goal in those first three sentences is to present in a way such that they would naturally say like, oh, well, then have you looked at this or what about this? Or have you thought like you want it to be a conversation as quickly as possible. And these three sentences, I, at least in my view, are a helpful way to do that. So these posters, when you put your posters together, they should kind of have that in mind. Like this is actually one that took first place in another conference. I really like this one. It was pretty simple. They again, notice how big this text is. It's ginormous text. This is like a three by four poster or maybe it's like a three by three. It might be actually totally square. But in any case, it's humongous text, right? Why should it be humongous? Because people don't want to read posters. It's just a prop. If you can't point at it and very quickly have them read it, and then you want to draw their eyes back to you because they should be talking to you and the poster is just a quick aside and then you bring them back, which you can do, by the way. Notice I'm doing this with my hands. We're not even in the same room and I can kind of do that same principle here. Um, you know, it, the text can't be small. It's got to be way bigger than you think. Like think like size 30 as the minimum and even that's small. That's like for up here at the top. Do big size of font when you put this together, be that in PowerPoint or Illustrator or whatever, okay? And then put simple short sentences. Don't use big long sentences. Like here they have a small sentence that says, perovskites are being commercialized using roll-to-roll -roll processing. Complication, this material is ferroelastic. And then in big red, here's their hypothesis. What happens when we bend these films, right? That's it. In one sentence, they could tell you why like, why did they do what they did? Well, because no one knew what would happen to that material if you bend it, right? So then they've got like, you know, as you anneal it, when you heat treat it, there's thermal stresses that might change how these ferroelectric domains exist in your material, right? Now, again, this is really for a material science audience, not for a general audience, but it's a pretty good poster. They made it really simple and they've got clear takeaways after strain release. The XRD shows that the walls have moved, you know, impacts, the degradation, ion motion, you can see it. Um, so I think there's a great poster. And if you're noticing a trend here is that less is more on these posters, make them beautiful by all means, like add nice colors, lay them out in a way that you find aesthetically pleasing, but less is more because it's just a prop. Okay. Here's one that has way too much text uh, from Kim C's group at Caltech. Kim's awesome, but there's just too much text on here. This sort of assumes that somebody's in the room alone with the poster and they're reading it, which never happens. Even when these are hung on the walls of your department, whatever, and people are milling around bored or, you know, whatever, you might think that they're looking at these and reading them, but most people are really not going to be reading them. They're just like sort of glaring at it. It'd be way better if they looked at it and saw just a couple key sentences like this. They'd actually come away with something than one that's just full of text like this. Um, but this one is beautiful. There's a great color palette that they've used all the way through. Um, it's really well done in that regard. Here's another one. <clears throat> There's kind of a lot going on here. There's some good and some bad things though. First off, they have an abstract. An abstract is like a one paragraph summary of your research. Some conferences require this. In my view, you should never have this on your poster. Even if the conference requires it, just don't do it because it assumes that people read posters and they don't. That's just wasted space. You can see that they even know it's wasted here. They made it like your eye does not go to this black spot. It goes to all these figures. It ignores that spot, which at least is like you're not wasting your time with something that shouldn't be there in the first place. But still, just don't put it there. And then look at this. There's like no text anywhere. This is all just figures with one small text highlight box. And in three sentences, they summarize their work. Let's read them. Lattice strain imposed by the deformation of an individual cathode particle profoundly modifies phase separation patterns. That is not written without jargon. So this could only be given at a meeting that understands that jargon. Second one says continuous curvature mitigates coherency strain and enables fast diffusion kinetics. Now the third takeaway, extended metastability of single phase regimes can be achieved by particle size, shape, dopant characteristics. So I think all those probably could have been said more simply, um, even in a technical conference. They're a little bit jargony even for me, um, but this is a pretty good poster. Um, how about this one? This comes from Jamie Nielsen. No, sorry, Megan Butala's group at Florida. She's fantastic. Um, I like this model where you have your figures and you have like a one sentence takeaway next to each figure. There's still too much text here. Like there's still too much text. But the idea here of like show a figure with like a takeaway sentence next to it, show a figure with a takeaway sentence. I don't mind that model. They, it just should be less. Beautiful color palette though. Here's another beautiful one from Kim's group. They always look really great. 
Um, this one comes from Dimitri Bedra. Oh, Forrest. This is from a student of my group. He's fantastic. This was a great one because he was talking about these forever chemicals. They're so-called forever chemicals that get put in our water. There's these fluoropolymer chemicals that are hard to get out. So he started out by really, look, like he used a quarter of his poster telling you why you should care about this. Fluoropolymers are everywhere. They are responsible. They've been linked to diseases. They're in all of our water, basically. And look in the world, like in, in the United States, if you think you're that they're not affecting you, they probably are, right? It's a great first column. That's somebody who really understands that his first job is to get you interested in this, right? Then he gets to a second one, like what was he trying to answer? And here he talks about the simulations and he's doing this with really big font, simple sentences, short little one sentence things. And you notice that it, nowhere does he say like motivation, results, conclusions. He doesn't do that because that's a waste of space. Instead, he puts full sentences. He says, what are PFAs and what concerns do they pose? Over here, simulations provide molecular level insights, improving experimental designs. And on the right, I gotta move my zoom thing. Visualized trends were quantitatively verified. What if design scenarios can now be investigated? Great job. He did a phenomenal job at this poster. Um, less is more. Pick a nice color palette. So lots of things going on. The only thing I would change is that the, the colors in these simulations are just so dog ugly. But I guess that's like because the simulation package he was using is made by barbarians or something. Um, here's another one. This was an undergrad summer research thing. This student was trying to tell you that there's microplastics all over the place, right? So the big part of her first proposal is that microplastics are all over. Check this. Uh, throwing an interesting statistic out is a great idea. She starts out by saying, did you know that you consume a credit card's worth of plastic every week? You, you on this call listening to that. It's you too. So now you've got their interest because they're like, what? And you're like, yeah, it's all over the place. So you want to eliminate them. That's the natural next second sentence. We want to get rid of them with a little device. How is that device going to work? And she'd say something about it, right? Shoot, we're out of time. Let me at least say something about poster 2.0. Um, maybe you've heard of poster 2.0 or better poster. It's trending online in a, it has been for a couple of years. It, it's this idea that as you walk through a lecture hall, you're probably not going to want to talk to everybody because not everyone's doing something that's relevant to you. So this guy's whole main contention is that when you put together your poster, you should have one great, big, easy to read sentence that tells people what you're doing so they can know whether they want to talk to you. This should be jargon free. So here's one. This came from Danny's work, which I already showed you a little bit earlier. It said machine learning methods are only as valid as the data provided development of materials database for high throughput experiment to accelerate high entropy alloy design. So if you're not interested in machine learning or materials or high entropy alloys, when you read that sentence, you just keep on walking, right? I think that's my problem with the better poster design is that it sort of assumes it's sort of like fishing, like you're throwing like a lure out and you're like, who's interested? I've made it really easy to tell what I do, but you're still trying to lure people in with just like reading a text. And that's not as good as you talking to them, right? So that's my one of my beefs with this, right? But the idea is that on the left-hand side, you have your title, who you are, and then you get like, you answer those three questions that I've been telling you about, like, why should they care about it? What did you do very simply? And what was the key takeaway, right? That was That's really what you put on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, he has what's called his ammo bar, where you can just put additional data, where if you think the conversation is going to take you in a way where you, you're going to want to talk about those, feel free to put them there. Some things about this are pretty slick, like, uh, let me show you another one. So here's one, it's the font is doing something crazy, but you can see that I put a QR code on the bottom of this big empty region in the middle. If you took a picture of that with your phone, I could be like, hey, if you wanna learn more, snap a picture of this QR code and my paper would pull right up in front of them. I mean, forgive the colors, I don't know what's happening here on this, that version, but um, here's another one where they use the big central region to put like some interesting infographics. But again, motivation, the scientific question, what did they do, ammo, right? I don't think this is a terrible way to present data. I, I'm not sure if it's the very best. I'll show you because we're out of time. This is again what I now do. This is by far the most common version of why I do. I have some sort of interesting graphics in the poster, some sort of color scheme. I have a figure and a one sentence, a figure and a one sentence, figure and a one sentence. And I lay it out as if they were my PowerPoint slides essentially. Um, but you know, there's not a right or a wrong way to do this. You can sort of think to yourself, what's my best way to achieve my goal out of this conference meeting? And Shoot, we're out of time and I could have gone on for another couple hours, but if you have questions or if you want me to give you feedback on your poster or if you want to learn how to do Python plots or use WebPlot Digitizer or anything we've talked about, 
Uh, I hope that you'll please feel totally unafraid to reach out to me. If you just Google Taylor Sparks, Utah, you'll, my email pops right up. You can find, I've got a, tutorials for all of this stuff on YouTube, like all of it. Um, and it's easy to do, I think. Anyways, I'm happy to help you out. So feel free to reach out. Are there questions I can answer now? We did get some pre-submitted questions. Um, you covered most of them. The only remaining one is where to have posters printed. And oh. I am putting a link in the chat right now to Knowledge Commons at the Marriott Library, which is the like the guaranteed place on campus where you can email them a, a version of your poster or put it on a thumbnail drive and bring it into Knowledge Commons and they can post it for you there or yeah. print it for you there. <laughs> Something I didn't know about that you might want to be aware of uh, for the OUR meeting. I don't think that it's an option, um, but if you travel to conferences and you have to fly and you have to put your poster in a suitcase, it, you don't want to fold it. It'll get all ugly and ruined, but there is the option to print posters onto cloth and it's great. They're really great. You can fold them up and put them in your suitcase and they look awesome and they're not even much more expensive. So that be aware that that's an option, especially if you're traveling. No clunky poster tube needed. For our symposium, you can totally print on fabric. Oh, great. Not for research yeah. on Capitol Hill, don't try it. But for the symposium, absolutely. Any other questions I can answer? You've been a great audience. Thanks for letting me pick on y'all. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Hope you have a wonderful Friday. Go enjoy yourselves this weekend. See you later. Um, and just as a closing reminder for everyone, um, if you logged in in real time, your uh, registration for the event already counts for your attendance. If you are watching this video later, please go to the education series page. Make sure you fill out that undergraduate research education series evaluation form for this uh, video so that I can know that you watched it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Quick question. Sorry. Um, oh, yeah, how big are the posters supposed to be? <clears throat> Shabri, you want to answer that? Because I think it depends on your the meeting that you're going to. It does. It totally depends on the meeting you're going to. And the conference should tell you what the dimensions um, are required. Um, I think if you're Dr. Sparks, you might throw throw their requirements to the wind and make the poster. Yes, however. you would. <laughs> <laughs> um, the typical kind of landscape format, I'm trying to find it on this website right now because I'm going to get it wrong. It's usually it's like three, three feet four. tall, four by wide. Yeah, yeah. usually. Four by one. Four by three. So three feet tall. Oh. Four wide. So 36 <laughs> inches tall, 48 inches wide. That's the most okay. common. Got it. Thank you so much. Okay. Best of luck, everybody. Feel free to reach out if you need help.